Hello, everybody. How you doing this morning? So good to see everybody. My name is Eric Bucci. I'm the lead pastor here at the Cornerstone Church. If this is your first time joining with us today, I personally want to welcome you. If you're watching online or if you are on vacation and just getting one last hurrah because this, this really kind of is the end of summer. Aren't you guys excited about that? <laughs> Come on. I'm looking forward to the snow. Come on. Am I the only one? Yeah, okay. I better stop before I have vegetables thrown at me. Well, it's so good to see everybody. Can you guys do me a big, big favor? Can you just welcome everyone that's watching online, everyone here for the first time, nice and loud. Well, we're so glad you're here today, and uh, we want to encourage you. And by the way, I just want to encourage you that if you've ever any prayer concerns or prayer requests, there's connection cards right in front of you. You want to just go ahead and fill that out and put a prayer concern or prayer request, and at the end of the service... You can put it in one of those boxes. We will make sure we will pray for everyone that is doing, uh, that, that puts that down. Well, let me ask you guys a question. You ever hear this, don't stop believing? Just a city boy. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> born and raised. Anyhow, you know that, we all know that song, Don't Stop Believing. Actually, it's been uh, downloaded over a billion times. It was at one time the most downloaded song uh, in Spotify in many places. And actually, the, the writer of that song is Jonathan Cain, who, him and Neil Sean, who are part of Journey. Yeah, I'm a heathen, okay? But uh, they wrote that song uh, in their Escape album. It became one of the biggest songs ever. And Jonathan Cain, who now is a believer, was sharing uh, as I Am Second, which is a, uh, a video series that shows different people. And he was saying that he didn't realize it at the time, but God was speaking through him through that song with that don't stop believing part. And even though the rest of the song may not be in the same vernacular and how God has led him. And, and it's one of the most famous songs. And there's a reason why, because a lot of us want believe we want to believe for something. Right. I, I want to believe. I don't want to stop believing. There's got to be more than this. Why? The reason why, you know, there's more than this is because there's more than this. In Ecclesiastes, it says he's put eternity inside our hearts. And we know things are not the way it should be. As C.S. Lewis once said, you never have a fish asking why it's wet. But human beings ask the question, why am I here? Because you're made by a loving God who desires to know you and have a relationship with you. And some things are fundamentally broken. And God wants to restore what is broken and bring you to a place back to your creative order. And one of the reasons he did that was to send Jesus to kind of get ready for his second coming. And you and I, those who believe in Jesus Christ, are to carry on that mission. So don't stop believing and praying. So every time you hear that song... Don't stop believing and praying. Make sure you put that in there, okay? All right. But seriously, we want to don't stop believing, but keep on praying. Believe God. And a lot of folks struggle with prayer because you're like, what is prayer? I mean, what's the sense of really praying? God is going to do what God is going to do, so what difference does it really make? I hear a lot of people criticize. I don't want your thoughts and prayers. Do something. And I understand that. Because sometimes that's a cop-out. How many of you have ever done that to somebody? I'll be praying for you. I think that's one of the biggest lies we tell each other. I'll be praying for you. We should be praying for each other. Praying is asking God, having communion with God, having a relationship with Him. And it's true, God works powerfully through prayer. He works in partnership with us. And if we don't pray, sometimes He won't act. Now, l let me just go ahead and set the, set the bar here for a few moments and set the standards. God has a sovereign will that you cannot shake. As the prophet M.C. Hammer said, you can't touch that. Okay? <laughs> this is not name that tune. I'm sorry, but I can't help it. But you can't touch that because it's God's sovereign plan. It's going to happen no matter what happens. However, there's a permissive plan, and there's an opportunity for you and I to make a difference through prayer. And much will not happen until we do pray, which we're going to talk about a little bit today. Bruce Wilkerson, who wrote the book called Prayer of Jabez, which actually took out a person in the Bible and Chronicles uh, named Jabez actually tells a story of an illustration in his book, which you can read in about 15 minutes. Talks about a man that went to heaven. Again, this is an analogy. This is not a true story. But the man comes to heaven and St. Peter meets him. And St. Peter is, is showing a tour of heaven and said, over here is this and the other. And he goes, what, what is that area over there with all those warehouses? What's the deal with all those warehouses? 
You don't want to go there. No, I want to see it. You don't want to go there. What are those? Well, those are all unclaimed prayer, answers to prayer that people did not ask. He says, where's my warehouse? Oh, you don't want to see that one. But I do believe much of what we don't experience and happen in our lives because we don't pray. God works in relationship with us. There are certain things that he's going to do no matter what. And there's his, I call it his will that's in flux, that you have an ability to pray. And you can see it throughout the Bible. I could show you story after story about Moses and about judging the Israelites and how God changed his mind, so to speak. And so there, there's an amazing teaching just in that alone. But let me just suffice to say that our prayers shape history if we pray the will of God. And God wants to work in partnership with you and I. And the enemy wants to do everything he can to get us stopped from praying because praying is powerful. And so what he'll do, if he can't get you in sin, he'll make it boring. He'll make you afraid. I can't pray. He'll get you discouraged. And a lot of people think it's just a wish. It's like going to, it's just like going to this, the, the casino, and not that I'd ever go there, but let's say going to the casino and hitting the slot machine and pulling the lever. And if it happens, it happens. I don't know what's going to happen. And maybe you're like me. You're looking, you like to control things. Uh, I don't know if you realize this, but you want to be God and so do I. No, you don't. Yes, you do. Self-deception is the biggest deception. And let me just say this flat out. All of us in this room and everyone watching online, you want to be God. Look at your neighbor and say, you want to be God. Go tell your neighbor that. Look at your neighbor and say, so do you, punk. <laughs> the truth is we all want to be God. We do. And if you don't know that you want control and you want to control your own destiny and you want everything to go your way, if you don't believe that, you're deceived. If you understand that propensity and you understand that gravitational pull for you and I to be God and want to be God, I have to fight it every single day. The Apostle Paul says, I die daily because every day I want to be God and so do you. This is where our problems come from. There's only one God, God Almighty. And so if you understand that and know that's the issue, then we can get someplace and realize that we all need a Savior. And so God wants us to pray so it's not our will be done, but his. Do you know Jesus even struggled with this? Why is it in the garden? He said, Father, if it's possible, remove this cup from me. He's trying to get out of it too. He didn't want to happen, but not my will. Let your will be done. So Jesus even battled with it as well in the temptations in the wilderness. So all of us have a propensity to want to be God. We have to understand that. I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. Always remember that, because you do. And all of us are sinners without God. We all make mistakes. we got to understand that. We have to be humble, as we talked about last week. And so I want to encourage us, as we enter this new season of fall, we want to make sure that we are set up properly. Now that summer's kind of over, we're going back to school. God bless the thank God for that. Hallelujah except for college. And you know, we're excited about that, and we like all that. But you know what? We want to get calibrated. We want to make put God first in this season. That's why we have something called Pray First. Where is it? Oh, I'm sorry. No wonder. I thought I reviewed the whole... Don't look. Don't look. Don't look. Don't look. Don't look. Don't look. <laughs> I was like, what's going on with these slides? They're not working right. See, I was supposed to say, don't stop believing, and then I was supposed to go like that. Yeah, see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. okay. But anyhow, we have 21 days of prayer coming. And that's what you need to pray for me, that I can do a better job of putting that, okay? We have 21 days of prayer that starts today, but we're not going to start officially here in this building in person until Tuesday. But we want to take some time to pray. I want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you to set up this next 21 days to get right with God, to get ourselves calibrated again. Uh, the worship team has done this with John and a bunch of others. What they did, they're like our test project, they took uh, a number of days, I think it was 40 days, if I'm not mistaken, I can't remember now, was it 40 days? No, not here. Okay, they're, they're eating in the green room. Okay, praise God. But they took some time, and they did not look at their social media or television for, I don't know how many days it was, at least 20 days. One month. Thank you so much. I knew it was one month. Thank you. I knew that. I just wanted to test and see if you were paying attention. <laughs> because I know everything. I'm joking. So they took a month, and, and, and they put it aside, and I've heard some testimonies saying, we're, we're just so amazed, and we're so happy. We're, I started reading books. I started reading the Bible. My anxiety levels started dropping. I started feeling better. Why? I spent more time with God. Maybe it's time that we get rid of Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat. Give it a little break. 
Can we give it a little, I'm not saying you're more religious or better than somebody else, but how about in these 21 days we give something up so we can replace it with something better? And maybe that would be a good place. Some of you, would, it, would, it would heal your marriages, right? I mean, let's be honest, we run this thing a lot. How about we just, I'm not saying you have to, but can we do something to recalibrate our lives? And so this is what we're doing, 21 days of prayer. Live services begin this Tuesday, September 6th. That's, uh, that's Tuesday, and we'll be going there for 21 days. And there's more things coming up. We're looking forward to a good month. We're starting to celebrate our 40th anniversary, which we'll talk more about. Not my 40th anniversary. I'm, I know it's, I, I can't believe I'm not, that, I'm not that old. You know, I'm younger than that. But uh, we're going to be talking about the church's 40th anniversary. It's coming up. Well, today I want to talk about this. Don't stop believing and praying. Don't give up on what God would have for us. Let's go ahead and we're gonna do, we're just gonna read the passage of scripture and we're gonna go back and break it down line by line, verse by verse, okay? I believe the word of God is a lot more powerful and stronger than some pep talk. So that's why in this church, we like to preach from the Bible, not to say that other churches don't, but we like the, word, we like the text of the Bible to preach itself because we believe it's the word of God and it will not return void, okay? Ask, this is from Matthew, Sermon on the Mount now, this is fact. Uh, chapters 5 to 7, and so he goes this. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Oh, what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil... Know how to give good gifts to those to your children. How much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask Him? And then, it seems like I should stop the reading here. Like this is kind of unrelated. It's not unrelated. This is part of it. Therefore, when it says therefore, that's what you need to ask a question. Why is it therefore? Because everything before. Therefore, it's connected. Okay. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you. Do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. We've heard this before. It's called the golden rule. It's not in the Bible, but we call it the golden rule. We're going to break this down a little bit more as we end today, but I just want to touch on it first. Okay? So in everything, do unto others as you'd want them to do unto you. If we would follow this principle, almost all problems would stop. All penal problems would stop. There wouldn't be crime. There wouldn't be arguments. If we would just do that, if we would treat each other like we want to be treated, everything would change. You know, the gospel is not complicated. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If we do those two things, we're done. The Bible just takes its care of itself after that. I'm just telling you. And so Jesus brings up this amazing rule that the world knows about, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, but hang on to that. But it's connected, okay? It's connected. Now we're going to go back to the areas that build up to that verse. Last week, we spoke about what? We spoke about judge, but don't be judgmental. We're not supposed to be judgmental because when you're judgmental, you become... Thank you. You remember that, don't you? Not politically correct, but... Okay. But today, we're moving on. We're going to this. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Now, if you look at it in the original Greek and you look at the verb tense, it is a continuous action. In fact, the New Living Translation does a good job of parsing it out in the proper sequence in regards to its language is this. Keep on asking. Keep on asking, and you will receive. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. Can you see there's a progression here that's happening? First you start, first what? Keep on asking. And how many have children know that kids can keep on asking? <laughs> Why? Please. I mean, they don't stop. They don't stop believing. They keep holding on to that feeling. Okay? There's a progression of prayer and intensity. He starts asking, seeking, and knocking. Asking, so, so first we start asking, right? Now we start seeking, and then we start knocking. Now, I, I had an illustration. I just want to bring it to your attention. Um, we, we brought our son Luke to Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, over almost two weeks ago now. And they happen to have these things they used to have up here, the Krispy Kreme donuts. They'll put you in an early grape, but they taste great, and you'll be happy on the way there. But they're fantastic, especially when the red light is on. They have a conveyor belt. It's unbelievable. 
it, I get so excited about it, okay? <laughs> these things, this dough, and it goes through a conveyor belt, and then it just drops in a big vat of grease. And then it goes through this, like, this little waterfall of frosting, and it comes out, and you put the thing in your mouth, and it just disintegrates into oblivion. <laughs> it's fantastic, okay? And to make matters worse, I mean, I almost put, I almost put the kids through the windshield. Thank God they had their seatbelt on. I saw the red light. When this red light goes on, it means it's fresh. So stop. We got to go. So we go in there, and we go there. And when the red light's on, I don't know if you realize this, you're going to the south. You can ask for a free donut, and they have to give you one. Free. You think they're biting donuts the way they give them out. But anyhow, that was bad. Okay, let's move on. Krispy Kreme Original Grace now. Okay, so imagine, and this happened, I actually bought a, a dozen donuts after I had my free one. Okay, and so imagine, if you will, I bring them home. And my family knows that they have to watch out for me sometimes. So my wife knows better. Uh-oh. Actually, I know better, honey. We better put these on top of the refrigerator lest the kids get them. <laughs> so now I go back, and I, I go downstairs. I, I go downstairs. I buy some, buy some beans. Come back. I, I make myself a nice pour-over of black coffee, delicious coffee, freshly brewed and all that. I have it here. I'm, I, all I need now is a Krispy Kreme donut, and I'm just going to be in, in, I'm gonna be in a perfect paradise of coffee and donuts. There's a reason why you call Dunkin' Donuts, by the way, because you dunk them in. Okay. So I'm all excited about that. I, I said, okay. I asked my wife. I said, honey, uh, where are the Krispy Kreme donuts? I started asking. She goes, they're in the kitchen. I'm like, you left them. Have you ever noticed you can't find things, but your wife knows where they are? There's been times I said, honey, where's my phone? It's just in your pocket. Okay. So now I, go, now I go to the kitchen, and I can't find it. Where is it? It's on top of the refrigerator. It's not on top of the refrigerator. So now, not only am I asking, now I'm seeking. Now I'm looking. Where is those donuts? Where are they? My coffee's getting cold. Where are those donuts, right? And then I realize, wait a minute. Why is my son in his room and his door is closed? <laughs> so now I climb up the stairs. Open up in there. Open up in there. Dad, it's going to be okay. Go open up. What are you doing there? You got those bad donuts. And I, then what happens? I keep knocking. He opens the door, and I have the donuts. So... For all you spiritual people out there that have good health, maybe just suppose someone stole tofu or cauliflower from you. If that's you, you got issues. We'll talk about it later. But that's just an example, everybody, that you'll never forget again. It's the fact that we start asking first. Then we start seeking. Then we start asking. This is what Jesus is telling us to do with our prayers. Don't just say, okay, if he wants me to have it, you'll have it. No, go after it. Don't stop. Don't relent. Keep going after. Keep believing. Don't stop believing. Don't stop praying. Keep on on. Keep on. That's what we're called to do. Keep on asking, and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and what you'll find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open for you. There's this missionary that we support. Her name is Summer. She's in France. And this woman, I don't know how many years ago, over 10 years ago, she kept calling her. She, I said, we're, not, we're doing a 1040 window. We're doing unreached people groups. We're, we're not doing France. But France is pretty unreached. That's fine. Goodbye. She calls me back again. She sends me an email. She keeps calling. Keeps calling. Keeps, she, she doesn't stop believing. She continues to knock, continues to call me over and over again, but she does it in a very kind way. And I'm like, you know what? This, if this woman believes that strongly what she's doing. How can we not support her as a church? So we looked at it and said, you know what, this woman, and we, we met with her, and because she kept asking and knocking, we gave her, and she's been our missionary for over 10 years, and he's doing a great work. She believed. She wouldn't stop. How many of us just give up? Don't stop believing. Don't stop praying. Don't stop going after the promises of God. If God has told you something, go for it. And so we're going to look at it a little more here, okay? Now, why don't we, it says here, okay, keep on asking, and you will receive. Keep on seeking, you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. And sometimes the door is closed, and you have to keep knocking until that door is open. Now, what happens with that? Well, you do not have because you do not ask. Some of us don't want to ask. Well, I don't want to bother God. I mean, who, little old me, who, he doesn't care about that. Yeah, he cares about you. We'll talk about that in a few moments. And so you do not have because you don't ask. Here's another reason we don't have. Uh, sometimes you ask and do not receive. So it says, you do not have because you don't ask. Okay, I'll ask. And now I asked, and what happened? 
I don't receive. Why? Why is that? Well, why is this? Because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. If it was up to, I don't want to embarrass my children, but when they were younger, they want to have Ben and Jerry's and play video games all day long and not go to school. We got a problem with food in my house, okay? I should get paid by all these companies. Because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passion. So we have wrong passions. So what is this all about? Why doesn't God answer some prayers like we want? Wrong motives is one reason. Or we don't believe. We just don't believe. We just go through the motions. But this is what's so interesting is this. In Hebrews 11.6, it's very important. The, the writer of Hebrews breaks it down and tells us the following. But without what? Faith. It's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must what? Believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who what? Diligently seek him. Don't give up. You ever hear of uh, Francis, Francis of Assisi? Okay. He believed. I have a couple stories about him and how he kept on praying and God came through. How about, how about St. Augustine? He wrote Confessions. And we also wrote a great book called The City of God, one of the greatest theologians in the last 2,000 years. Well, he wasn't always a believer. And he was going his own way. Did not believe in God. But he had a praying mother named Monica who would not stop believing. She kept praying for over 10 years, kept praying, 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 praying. One day, uh, St. Augustine's walking, before he was St. Augustine's walking through a garden, and it, it, he hears the words, open and read. He opens and reads Romans. He gives his life to Christ, and the rest is history. We have a dear friend of our family. I've used this before, but it's one of the greatest illustrations. Is I had a new lady that prayed for 17 years for her husband to give her life, his life to the Lord. 17 years. And God said, stop nagging him. And that might, be a, uh, that might be something for somebody here today. Just pray for your husband. Don't nag him. And one day, she felt like the Lord said, today's the day to tell him he needs to get right with God. And he did, and he gave his life to Christ. And they ministered for many years together. She's now home with the Lord, but he's still around. Don't give up on prayer. The Bible says every prayer is collected in gold bowls in the book of Revelation. We believe that many of the prayers that I'm experiencing today are because of my grandparents that prayed when I was alive. There's an account in heaven. And even the prayers for this nation are still being heard by God in this country, in this world. But without faith, it's impossible to please. And we must believe he's a, he exists and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We must go on and do it, on and on. Don't give up. So sometimes it's wrong motives. Sometimes we don't believe. And sometimes it's not God's will. I thank God he didn't answer my, my prayers. There's some prayers I prayed. My Lord, if I would have gotten answered, I would not be on the stage today. I would not have the beautiful family that I have. Thank God he didn't answer my prayers. Ruth Graham said, I thank God many times over that he didn't answer my prayer because if he did, I would have never married Billy Graham. So sometimes God knows what's best for us. In fact, not sometimes, all the time. So we are to pray and we have to realize it may not be God's will. And so 1 John says this about the will of God, okay? And this is the confidence that we have. These are believers, people who believe in God and follow Jesus Christ. Not those that like Christianity and like the philosophy of Christianity. These are people that have given their lives to Jesus Christ, okay? And this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to your will, what does it say? Whose will? His will. He hears us. And if we, hear, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked him. Now, if you've been alive for a little while, maybe some of you have seen some answers to prayers and some not answer to prayers. We've had some situations, we prayed for people that had cancer, they were healed. We prayed for other people and they died of cancer. I'm the kind of person that when I put the light switch on in the, in the room, I want it to go on. I don't like not to be able to predict what's gonna happen. So I'm the kind of guys, and naturally, I'll say, you know, forget the light switch, I'm gonna use a candle or a flashlight. And some of us have asked God to do things for us in the past, and he has not come through like we want. So you know what? I'm not going to pray anymore. If I expect too much, I'll be disappointed. So I don't want to expect too much. I'm not going to pray anymore. Maybe that's you. 
Maybe you've been praying for so many years and nothing has happened. You don't realize it could be that next prayer. And by the way, you're not God and neither am I. We don't see. We see through a glass darkly, the Bible says. You don't know the complete What's going to happen in all of history? We have a little slice of, you know, ever hear need-to-know basis in the military? There's something called a need-to-know basis. And they'll tell the men and women on the field what they have to do, but they don't tell them the war room plans. It doesn't make any sense. I remember watching uh, Saving Private Ryan. In it, Tom Hanks, who's trying to get this guy out, uh, does not understand. He's losing all of his men, and he has to act like he has it together. He goes behind in a quiet place, and he starts crying. He's like, why am I doing this mission? They don't understand the reason why, but there is a reason. God knows what the reason is. we got to trust him. We continue to pray and ask. Now, you can be like the Apostle Paul, who went through di three different seasons of asking God that he might remove this thorn in the flesh. We don't know what the thorn in the flesh was exactly. And God says, no, my grace is sufficient for you. So we don't always know, okay? But he will answer our prayers. Either several different things he'll say. He'll say yes, he'll say no, or go slow. Wait, sometimes you have to wait. Abraham and Sarah, I'm going to make you a father of many, of, of many nations. They had to wait. 20 Five years for Isaac to be born. And by the way, they took matters in their own hands and caused a, a boatload of problems. But he still called a man of faith in the book of Hebrews. So sometimes it's yes, no, or go slow. God's going to answer our prayers. You may not like how he answers our prayers. Don't stop believing and praying. Keep on praying. Keep on asking. Matthew 7, 7 through 12. Now we get to the next part. It says this. Or what? This is, first he says, knock, ask, seek, right? Now we come to the next part of the scripture verse. Or what man is there among you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? What's so interesting about the bread, I've been to Israel and they had a lot of sandstone there, limestone. And if you see a limestone round rock, it looks like a loaf of bread. It, really, it looks like he went to Panera Bread. I'm going to start dropping more and more companies while I'm at it. I didn't mention Costco yet or Chick-fil-A, so I'm, I'm doing fine. So, so you sit there, and you have this rock. You, it looks like a loaf of bread, and that's why you're saying it. So imagine you're asking for a bread, and you bite on it, you break your teeth. No. All right, if he asks for bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? Some scholars think it means an eel, which is a, not a kosher animal to eat. So you say, am I going to give you something bad? No. If, uh, if, what, look what he says here. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask Him? We have a good Father, everybody. We have a Father that loves us and wants the best for us. I don't give my children everything they want. And I thank God my parents didn't give me everything I wanted when I was a kid because I would have got myself in big trouble, right? So trust God. Continue to ask. And know that trust God and rest in God knowing that he knows what's best. Keep on asking. There's nothing wrong with that. So if you being evil know how, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So continue to pray. Continue to ask God. Don't give up on prayer. Keep on believing. Keep on asking. So in Hebrews 4.16 says this. So let us come boldly to the throne of gracious God. There we will receive his mercy. And we will find grace to help us when we need it the most. God wants us to come to him. By the way, when it says ask, it's a command. God wants us to ask for things. I, I, I've, I've waited times for my children to ask me. I want to give something to them, but I want them to earn it. I want them to go after it. And I want them to ask me. You have not because you ask not. My friends, how many things in your life and my life are not happening because we don't ask? And we don't pray. And we don't believe. How many things in our life happen that way? You see, you and I are God. We want to be God. We want to think, control things our way. If I can't have it my way, I'm going to throw a monopoly board in the air and walk away from this game because I'm losing. That's how we often act. But we got to trust God in what we're doing. You see, the way we pray is determined by our view of God. The way we pray is determined by our view of God. If we think God 
is some angry, cantankerous old man that has aches and pains and wants to throw a wheelchair at you at any moment, or we think he's a loving, benevolent God, or he's out there, or do we think he's a God that loves us and wants the best for us? Maybe some of you grew up with a bad father. I don't know. But I tell you, he, we have a good father, a father who loves us and wants the best for us. So we go back to the golden rule. Why do we go back to the golden rule? Because it all kind of goes to this one verse. It's like the Mount Everest, if you will, of the Sermon on the Mount we come to. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law of the prophets. This is called the golden rule. What's so interesting is there's other ancient writings that are out there. For example, Buddha, 500 years before Christ, said the following. He said, hurt, hurt not others as you'd want to be. That's what he said. Hurt not others. Then we have other people in history. We have Confucius. I call him confusing. And the 46 BC said, I found, he said this, never impose on others which you would not choose yourself. So, and, and then we look at Hinduism and Taoism and all these other different things. And what's so interesting is it always tells you, do not ask people to do things you would not want to be done to you. It's always in the negative. So therefore, if I do someone no harm, I'm doing fine. But Jesus is different than everyone else. You know what he says? Instead of saying do no harm, do good before. In other words, we're to go out and treat others like we want to be treated. How does the world change? If everyone tries to do no harm, that helps a little bit. But that's kind of self-motivated, isn't it? I don't want to do any harm causing me trouble because it would happen to me. Karma. Or how about this? Let me be a blessing to somebody else. Let me reach out to somebody else. Let me treat somebody else like I would want to be treated. And, and the moment I want to bring correction to someone and tell them off, wait a minute, would I want to be told off that way? Would I want to be treated that way? Would I want my spouse or my parents or my friends to treat me? Do I want my friends to gossip about me behind my back and speak about my behind my back when I'm not there? If people can speak about someone else when they're not there, they're going to speak about you. I'm telling you right now, do you want to be treated the same way? You see, in Luke 6.38, it says the following, and this is very important you understand this. A lot of people use this for giving and tithing. That's not the principle of this. This is different than that. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down shaken together and running over be put into your bosom. What would happen is they would go get some grain and you would get it and you would shake that grain to make sure it goes down to the bottom. And then you'd take your, 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 your garment and you'd go like this and it'd fill it more. And you would get as much as you can at the market. What he's saying here is give and it will be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your bosom for with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Can I hear a holy ouch? Yeah, I don't like that very much, right? So how do we treat others is how we'll be treated. Now, why do I say all this for? And why does Jesus say all this for? Because this is what the truth is. You can't rightly apply this principle of treating others like you want to be treated until you follow the first part. If you know you have a loving father who wants the best for you, if you know you can ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you, if you know you have a loving father who wants your best, then with that attitude and that understanding, you can begin to help other people. You see, you treat each other like you treat God. I treat other people like I treat God. You cannot get away from it. The Bible says in 1 John, if you hate your brother whom you do, do see, you cannot love God whom you do not see. The principle is this. You treat God like you treat other people. Especially the people you love, supposed to love the most. So, if you understand that you can seek and you will find, knocking the door will be open to you, and you know you have a loving Father in heaven that will take care of you, then you can extend that grace to other people by, how about going first? The Bible says, while we are sinners, Christ died for us. Well, when they do it, then I will. No, I'm going to go ahead and go out. Just yesterday, I was pumping the gas. It's been a fortune. And I saw some trash on the floor. And, I, and I'm ready to pull away. I'm like, no, I'm going to pick it up. So I pick up the trash around me. And I put it in the, in the dumpster. Why? Because I want to make a difference. I want to leave someplace better than I came. 
Because that's my calling, and that's your calling. We're going to make a difference in the world, whether it's a piece of trash on the floor or make someone else better. Why not be a blessing to other people? In our small group this past week, which we love, our men's group, a gentleman told a story of how he went with, with a bunch of men to Acts 4, a ministry we support, and helped clean the floor and helped organize it and all that. They helped the poor and give furniture and stuff. And uh, meanwhile, his son was buying tires for his car, and he forgot his credit card or something, wasn't working, and he had to get forked. He couldn't get it, so his father had to come and get him. While he's on the line, a guy on the line hears the story and goes up to the counter and says, because the, 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 guy's, the, the, the guy's son said, you know what I'm going to do? I'll put cheaper tires on it. The man goes up to the counter and said, put the best tires on that car, four of them. Laid his credit card down, paid for it, and walked away. No one knew who it was. Why? God's a benevolent God, a loving God. And so what, is, what are they doing? They're doing the right thing. They're, they're helping other people. Why, why this gentleman, why this father of the, of the son is going to help other people and pouring out and being a blessing, God took care of him and his son was amazed by that. This is the kind of God we serve. So go out and make a difference in the world. Don't just be a consumer. We don't need consumers. We need producers. Don't be passive. Make a difference. And this is what Jesus is calling us to do. Do no harm. I'll do no harm. No, that's not good enough. Make a difference. Change. You don't like the school system? Go to the school board. You don't like what's going on? Make, make a change. Show grace. So light, right? We make a difference that way. Be a blessing. Don't wait for someone to ask you for forgiveness. Go to them. Don't wait to, to, to be a blessing when they will. No, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to be a blessing. I'm going to do to others as I've had them do unto me. Because God has done it to me when I was still a sinner. Do you, do you get what he's saying here? You see how that's different? Rather than do no harm, I'm going to change the world by doing the right thing, by showing God's love. Listen, don't be like Elvis and shoot TV sets because you don't like the news. Actually, it wouldn't be a bad idea to do that, incidentally, to stop watching it. Why, why not be the change you're looking for? Anybody can sit in their pajamas in their basement on the computer and complain and be arm, armchair generals. How about we go out there and be the change you want to see in Jesus' name? Right? This is what he's calling us to do. With the same measure that you use, it will be used back to you. I want to be blessed. So, man's benevolent, God blesses him back. This just happens all the time. How about the Lord's Prayer? And forgive us our sins as we've forgiven those who sinned against us. And then Jesus goes back and reiterates, this is part of, our, the, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. He says this, but if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive you of your sins. So how we treat others, we will be treated. Why not give out grace to other people as you've received grace? My friends, none of us have it together. If you think you have it together and you think you're so great, you're not great. You're a, you're a mess without God. And I'm a mess without God. The Bible says all have sinned. And fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one that's righteous. No, not one. And the brilliance of the gospel is that Christ died for us and accepts us all if we receive it. It gets rid of all the caste system. I'm better than you. And no, forget all that. And it would be wonderful we realize we're all saved by God. And he loves us and he wants the best for us. That's what we want to be able to do. So, don't stop believing and praying. The power of praying with each other in unity. Now, you take the prayers. And you keep asking. I'm going to ask the worship team to make yourselves ready, please. Watch what will happen. It's why we encourage you to get around other people. The Bible says one can chase a thousand, two, ten thousand. Woe is a man who's by himself, says Ecclesiastes. But two can help fight. You see, therefore, confess your sins just to God. No, to each other and pray for each other. All through the Bible, it's each other. So that you may be healed. The prayers of a righteous man is powerful and effective. How is a righteous man powerful and effective? It's powerful and effective when we join together in faith with the body of Christ. Are we connected to other people? What do we have small groups for? Are we not just trying to do a program for program's sake? But when I hear testimonies of how people are, are praying for each other, visiting each other in the hospital, helping their children, helping people go through all situations, it's, uh, it's, it's organic, it's beautiful, it's wonderful. I see it happening right here. I encourage you, don't just come to church. This is good. 
You go in the temple, you, you worship God together. There's a dynamic that you get in the larger gathering. But there's something that happens when you get together with two or three or more. In my name, I'm in the midst of them. God wants to bless community. So we encourage you as you walk out of here today, there is an opportunity for community. Sign up for a small group. If you can't find a small group, let us know what works for you. We'll make one up for you. I understand a lot of you guys are, have big schedules, and we understand that. We're not being legalistic. What I'm trying to say is get connected to other people in the body of Christ, that we can encourage each other to go the right direction. You see, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The only way this thing works is that you have to be a child of God so he can be your father. And he's reaching out to you and me today saying, come, I'm your father. I want to bless you. I want to love you. But you have to be willing to step down from being your own God. You don't know everything, and neither do I. God, I surrender. I step down. I resign. I'm not the chairman of the board. I'm not the owner of the company. I'm not the CEO. God, you're in charge of it all. You've got to be willing to do that. And also, ask him to forgive you and forgive you of your sins. Because you can't save yourselves. But he saved you. And I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Are you a child of God? Have you given your life to Jesus? It's not enough just to believe in him. The Bible says even the enemy believes in him and shudders. There has to come a point where you surrender your life. And so my question to you today is this. I ask this question all the time. If you were to die today, you were going to go to heaven. And it was, why should I let you into heaven? And if you say, well, I'm a pretty good person compared to everyone else, he doesn't get it. There's only one way to heaven. It's through Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Christ paid the penalty for you and I. He took all of your sins, all your, all your junk upon himself and gave you freedom. You and I are destined for death row, but Jesus took the electric chair for us so we could be set free as if we've never sinned. It's faith in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes, and give you an opportunity to do that right now. How many of you would say right now, Pastor, if I were to die right now, I don't know for sure I'd be in, with the Lord Jesus in heaven. I don't know for sure. Or maybe I used to walk with God, and I've walked away. I want to get right. We had several in the first service. How many would say to here today, I don't know where I am, but I want to get right with God today? Just raise your hand nice and high. Anyone today? Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Let's pray. Anyone in line? Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and paid for my sins. I believe you rose again from the dead. Today, I ask you to come into my life. I resign from being in charge of my life. I give my life to you. Thank you that you're my creator and you know what's best for me. I believe you rose again from the dead. And I hand my life over to you today. Thank you. Based upon those two things, I am now a child of you. In Jesus' name, amen.